yeah. on behalf of Mumbai Research Center of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, I welcome author, novelist, poet, and translator Jerry Pinto. Uh, let me introduce Jerry Pinto to our audience. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I can hear you. Yeah. So uh, Jerry Pinto believes that the city itself is an act of translation. from idea of community to factory of identity he has translated several mumbai books from marathi to english and will talk about the experience of working between and through languages of m and the big hoon and murder in mahim both set in the city of mumbai he has welcomed daya pawar's he has translated daya pawar's baluta malika amar sheik's memoir i want to destroy myself and eknath awards strike a blow to change the world so i welcome mr jerry pinto once again and the session is all yours sir uh, madhu how long do you want me to speak and then do you want to do a audience interaction um one hour which is inclusive of qa so it is inclusive of qa so i'll speak for about 40 minutes and then i will uh, sure. i will take questions madhu will you give me the questions or will you uh, shall we open it to everyone um, what would you be comfortable with i'd be comfortable with one person directing the the flow of traffic as it were fine so i'll do that thank you very much okay so i'm going to start by telling you a little story not far from here where the parrot sings there was a land called monol monolingua it was inhabited by monolinguals who never felt as well as they could be they weren't unhealthy just not as bright as happy as they might be they consulted their shaman a she man and she said you need salt from alta lingua alta lingua was on the other side of the fast flowing river called meening this was a wonderful river that fertilized their land and gave them water to drink but it was also tricky there was the current of misunderstanding and the whirlpool of connotation and the rapids of literal interpretation however a call went out for volunteers to fetch the salt from monol from altlingua and a young carrier the older guys are shook their heads it was a stupid thing to do they thought but the carrier was young and foolish and wanted something more something better more vibrant more alive more words more sounds a lot more she set off across the river in a boat made of wood and on the other side she was welcomed by the altlingwood they were delighted to see her and when she explained that she needed some salt they said they were willing to have to let her have as much salt as she wanted but by their laws she would not be allowed to carry it in any container receptacle or bag how am i supposed to carry the salt across chairs the alter lingual smile the young woman could see that the smile said that is really your problem not ours the young woman spent the night in prayer to the goddess of walks and in the meaning in the morning in the fluffy form thing overhead she saw something that looked like a boat and she realized she would have to abandon the boat in which she had come and make a boat of salt and so the young carrier of meaning fashioned the boat of salt and put it into the river of meaning which immediately began to put out little investigative tongues of water licking at the boat she jumped in but even before she had picked up the oars the salt began to dissolve the carrier paddled frantically the river was fast and the water took large chunks from her boat when she got to the other side not much of the boat was left the monolinguals were not happy how little salt you brought across this side the carrier shrugged i will go again she said knowing full well that each time they would complain again the city is an act of translation according to them the idea of civitas civilization is an act of translation we come we are told a bag of desires and and emotions and needs and self centeredness and we learn to live with other people we learn to translate our needs and desires we learn to modify our behavior through 
imitation, through interaction, and through watching other people, my messes. We trans, we go from being bipedal omnivores to being homo sapiens. We translate ourselves into a binomial nomenclature. We say we are knowing, we are makers, homo faber, and homo, and at times, uh, animal laborans. How many times do we translate who we are? The city manufactures its own identity, and then it translates its residents, giving them other names. One person may say, I am a Bombay man, or a Bombayite. Another person will say, I am a Mumbai cut. And you immediately begin to parse that with a connotative sense of identity. Can one denote? Can a name ever denote? So each time you encounter a name, it will be wrapped up in an identity. It will be wrapped up in a connotation. And that connotation will be something that you will translate. So therefore, you get a name, you encounter a name like, uh, you'll encounter a name like, say, Cyrus Gusgar. And immediately you know that there is a certain identity associated with Cyrus Gusgar. You know that you're talking to, and there's a whole bag of understanding that you bring to that identity. And then you see a name like Jerry Pinto. And what can anyone read the name Jerry Pinto, say in the UK, not in India, and know what my identity is, okay? Uh, can anyone read the, read the name Jerry Pinto in India and wonder what that identity is? Somewhere towards the end of the last century, it became the habit to launch books, okay? So books started their intellectual journey in the world by being launched as if they were ships. No one broke a bottle of champagne on the spine of the book. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, there seems to be uh, people in the waiting room, so I was checking that. Um, somewhere towards the end of the last century, as I was saying, it became the habit to launch books, to start the intellectual journey with an event. The event wasn't champagne based, it was more chai and biscuit, but because the thing that was on offer was supposed to be uh, intellectual food, food for the mind, and not so much food for other parts of the gray of the limbic system. So I've translated now several books from Marathi. This may sound a bit like a commercial break, but I just want to establish that. I've translated Cobalt Blue by Sachin Kumbalta, Baluta by Daya Pavar. I Want to Destroy Myself by Malika Amar Sheikh. I, the Salt Doll by Vandana Mishra, Half Open Windows by Ganesh Matkari, When I Hid My Cast and Other Stories by Baburao Babul, and Strike a Blow to Change the World by Ekna Tawar. I will talk a little about each one of these books, or which, whichever of these books actually relates to uh, the city of Mumbai, the city of Bombay, the city of Momoi, the city of Mamai, the city of Goa, Bahia, whatever you want to call it. And at each launch, whenever there were launches, and there were launches for the first three books or four books before I just gave up the idea of ever launching a book of translation because it was tiring to listen to the same question. I was asked variants of it. At each of these launches, I was asked variants of the same question. Do you know enough Marathi to translate from Marathi into English? Uh, the first time I was asked the question, I was so taken aback, I didn't know how to answer. Later, I paused it. I began to realize that again, an act of translation had taken place, and that act of translation was connotative rather than denotative. In other words, people had read my name and translated it, not looking at what it actually means, which, the, which is the holy name of God, Hieronymus. Uh, but they looked at it as a Roman Catholic boy from Goa, and a Roman Catholic boy from Goa denotes monolingualism, denotes a lack of any knowledge of his of other languages other than English. And so that question would be asked. Had my name been uh, Jaitir Pant, for instance, uh, they would probably have uh, had not asked that question, I suspect. Uh, the polite variant of this question was, it is very commendable that you know so much, but that you should have learned Marathi so well. So this is also a city moment, therefore, that translation enterprise, where identity politics will have, have its say. And since you are celebrating Jashni Mumbai, I have to say that Cobalt Blue uh, is uh, at is a is a, a moment of translation because there isn't um, 
there isn't a, a recognizable city in the book. In fact, it's a hybrid city. There is one scene that is set outside an art gallery uh, where I think uh, the young uh, protagonist is being talked to by an environmental group. And that's clearly Jahangir art gallery. It's clearly the setting is seems to be Jahangir art gallery. But when uh, Ganesh Chaturthi is described, then it becomes very clearly Pune. This also is what happens to the topos. It is what happens to the landscape. It what is happens to the cityscape when a creative artist needs a bit of Pune and a bit of Mumbai and will therefore use them with an imaginative geography, with a regardlessness of what the enterprise of, the, of uh, someone like uh, a critic is, who wants a location, who wants a setting, who wants, who wants to be told that it is Mumbai or Pune and wants to be able to identify uh, the city. Uh, Baluta was much clearer. It was uh, much clear, it was clear that the city was, that the lo locations were Mumbai and on the one hand, and on the other hand, it was uh, the village that, uh, that the Konkan village from which Daya Pavar came. I'll read uh, a bit about that from, his, from my translation of Daya Pavar's Baluta. My childhood was divided between the village and the city. It would not be wrong to say that I had one foot in the city and one in the fields. Perhaps this is why I am never really at home in either place. Just as Krishna ripped Jarasandha's body into two and tossed them apart, my life has split my psyche into two. Later he says, he talks about why this difference. He grew up in the village. You know, many people who live in, in the city, especially at the, in the lower, on the lower rungs of society, would like their children to grow up in the village, mainly because it's, a clean, it's cleaner air, cleaner water. Um, you know, there's some assurance of, uh, of safety, of someone to look after the child, which may not be true if both parents are working. And therefore, they come to the city and leave the child behind. Um, but eventually, circumstances will bring the child to the city. Something will happen in the village which will convince them. My father worked, Dayapavar's father worked at the dry docks in Mumbai. And here's another lovely translation. I called him Dada. My son calls me Dada too. I would not like it if he were to address me as Daddy or Papa. Even Papa. Daddy, yeah, you would think, but even Papa. It feels like someone calling the humble cactus Opantia Vilaini, which is the it, uh, the Latin name, the binomial nomenclatural name of the of the cactus. What was I saying? He's interrupted himself. He's come back. Yes, at that time we were living in Tawakhana. Now this is another moment for me. A city that reading a book translates the city for you. My grandmother grew up in Bata, lived in Baikala. I grew up going to Baikala fairly regularly. You know. I visited it all the time. I went to play in Christchurch compound. I hung around Clare Road and I'd never heard of Tawa Khan. At that time, we were living, writes Daya Pavad, at Tawa Khan, in a 10 by 12 foot room, a tap inside, inside common toilet outside. I, Aji, and my paternal cousin's family all lived there. You won't find Tawa Khan on, on any map of Mumbai. At that time, the tram from Khada Parsi turned into Oras Road on its way to Girgaon. Aji says, his grandmother says, that she remembers horse-drawn trams. She would tell me her memories. As a child, I would dream of horse-drawn trams. Those horses foaming at the mouth, struggling to get the trams up the bridges. Nagpada props itself up against this bridge. And in the middle of Nagpara was Tawakhana. Today it's all tall buildings, five or six stories high. On one end was Chor Bazaar or the Thieves Market. On the other end was Kamathipura, the red light area. Golpitha was where the prostitutes lived. Tawakhana was squeezed between these two. The Mahar community lived in a small island in these surrounding areas. All of us came from the Konkan Plateau, from Sangamnir, from Akola, Junar, Sinar, 
and around us there were communities of Christians and Muslims. The Mahars lived in squalid homes, each the size of a hen house, each hen house having three or two or three sub tenants. Wooden boxes acted as partitions, but they were more than that. They, we stuffed our lives into these boxes. At nights, temporary walls would come up made of rags hanging from ropes. The Mahar men lived, worked as hamals or laborers. Some worked in the mills and factories. None of the women observed parda. How could they? They worked harder than the men. What is interesting to me about this moment uh, and a book that I translated later, this combination of events. Uh, as you all know, on April 14, uh, 1944, uh, for, uh, ship called the Fort SS Fort Stikin sailed into Bombay's harbor and exploded. It was carrying cotton, it was carrying dynamite, and it was carrying gold bars. Um, now, the thing about cotton is that, as everyone knows, if you leave it lying, a big heap of cotton, tapus, just lying around, the internal heat of cotton is so high that it will catch fire spontaneously. Therefore, someone has to come and spray it all the time and keep it, keep it wet, otherwise it'll burn. The man who was supposed to do that went AWOL. He just skipped. And the cotton got fire, the dynamite blew up, the gold bars flew through the air and landed in the, in the balcony of a Parsi gentleman who returned them to the police. I'm not challenged. You can't do this sort of thing. Just throwing gold bars into my balcony. What will? What is the, the world coming to? And the city began to burn. Now, in in Daya Pawar's Baluta, he talks about that moment when the city was burning, and he, and his, and the Mahas <clears throat> to run towards the explosion because they knew there was scrap, and in in scrap there was money to be made. And so they headed towards the explosion. At the same time, I was translating, I mean, a couple of years later, I was translating another book uh, by, I think somebody got their mic on and uh, could you, and there's some strange sounds coming through. Could you please mute? Thank you. Uh, I was translating Nimi Chibali by Vandana Mishra. Wonderful, interesting life. Uh, Vandana Mishra starts her life as a locally girl. She's also from the Konka. She's a Brahmin. And uh, her father dies of an airborne virus. He dies of influenza. Her mother is left with, with uh, these children, three children. There's no support. So finally, the community gets together and decides that the best thing for her would be for her to be trained. Her Vandana's mother, Sushila Lotlikar's mother, is second or third standard pass. She's not an educated woman. Uh, so there's no way she can get a job. So it was decided that the best thing for her to do would be for, the best thing the community could do for her was put her into a training program for midwives at the JJ hospital. She goes and does that program and then she begins to work. She works for many years. She then gets a job in a private uh, in a private hospital. She's well respected there. She's well treated there. Until one day she's doing a night shift, and in the night someone throws acid on her back. This is listed in the police files as an accident. Seems like a very strange accident where someone can have acid thrown on their back. But her mother is bedridden after that, cannot work, and so Sheila must go to work. Uh, she has the good fortune. Uh, to be recommended by the man who played Santukaram in the film uh, to a teacher of drama. And this teacher of drama, by the way, is this Altekar. It's the same teacher of drama who taught Satyadev Dube. Uh, lovely those connections that you begin to stumble across. And he, uh, she becomes uh, an actress on, hold your breath, on the Gujarati stage. She's not in Marathi uh, theater, she's on the Gujarati stage and the Gujarati stage at Bhangwadi. Okay. So another bit of translation. She starts, she learns and she speaks Gujarati fluently. Uh, she's 
acting as in Gujarati plays, and, but she comes to the conclusion that her career has stalled a little because she's playing the second lead all the time. She's not playing, she's not the heroine. She's not got like all the big lines and the dramatic monologues. She's uh, playing opposite the comic, the comedian, and she's got to play a comic role. She's, okay, she's making a living, she's got a fan following, but she's not happy. And so here again, she act, it's another act of translation. She moves from that stage, she moves to the, to the Marwadi theatre. And there she plays, uh, uh, she plays, you know, she's a heroine. She does extremely well. She gets a huge fan following. Marwadi women come to her with their jewelry and say, you made such a sacrifice for your love because, you know, in the, uh, the course of the play, uh, she's, she falls in love with her. She's a rich woman and she falls in love with a poor boy and, and they die together. And then they go up to heaven and they swing on, on little ropes about the earth on rope swings above the stage, singing a song to each other. And the audience is terribly moved, terribly moved, you know, and so moved that they want her to wear their jewelry up to heaven. Okay, so she's doing very well. Then her mother says to her Babi, which is the best name by which she is, uh, is, she is uh, referred to. Sorry. Um, by which she is referred to. Uh, Babi, it's time for you to get married, otherwise you won't get married. So at the age of 21, she stops working in the theater. But now I'm telling you this long story simply because she also lives through that Bombay dock explosion, the great Bombay dock explosion. And she runs from it. So here, here are two trajectories, the middle class moving away, the underclass moving towards the sort side of tragedy. This movement fascinated me. Malika Amar Sheikh's book, which I did after that, I mean, actually I did it between Paluta and Singh, is, an, is really a very much a Bombay book. Uh, she grew up in a chawl in, uh, in central Bombay. She spends most of her life in the city. Her husband, Namdev Dhasar, who has famously written about Golpita, which Daya Pawar mentions, he lives very close to Golpita. Uh, except that he holds away from it because he's very clear that Kawakhana is not Gold Pita. Gold Pita is where the prostitutes are. Kawakhana is where the Mahars are. Uh, whereas Namdev Rasal jumps with his poetry, like leaps into the center of, of uh, Gold Pita. Uh, she's, she lives with him. She suffers. She suffers. Tremendously, she's a very young woman. She's underage when she marries him. She must be 16 or something uh, like that. Uh, but they get a, a special license and they get married. She has a child and she tells her life with an astonishing measure of honesty. There is, there is no, there is no shield between herself and her reader. She talks about the things that she didn't do. The fact that she couldn't, she rarely could complete a course. She tried to study typing, but didn't finish that. She tried to do this, but she couldn't finish that. She tried, she tried, she tried, but she did. It's interesting. I mean, her, her life journey is, is really, really interesting. Um, I then translated Half Open Windows by Ganesh Mankar. Now this, uh, this happened because one, I'd done all these books and I thought it was time to encounter the Marathi cosmopolitan because Matkari's book is very clearly the Marathi cosmopolitan. It is the, uh, it is a bunch of young people, Maharashtrians who often lapse into English. They often speak English because that's how they live. They live bilingual lives. They think probably bilingual thoughts. This is not on. That kind of phraseology. It's a very interesting pattern of um, for an, it could be read as short stories, could be read as a novel. So it's, a, it's a short stories that work, have an interlinked, have an interlinked narrative, a thread holds them together. Uh, and this thread is really the city. 
and the manufactured city and the manufactured need or the manufactured artificiality of housing prices. Yeah? Uh, it's worked around that. It's the, Madhkari himself is an architect and, uh, and also uh, deeply involved in cinema. And you see that in the book. And that's what drew me to the book. There's a moment when he talks about, uh, about the landscape of the city. Yeah, he's climbing up into uh, one of the characters in the book, a strange character um, who's not quite a villain, but not quite a hero either. A very gray character takes the lift up into a skyscraper that they are building, which is halfway complete, and stands on the top and looks at the city around him looks at the merging of the old and the new, looks at the erosion of the old, but not with the nostalgia that all of us, uh, you know, old Bombay hangs, as it were, old Mumbai hangs, as it were. Think about of the loss of heritage. He's seeing opportunity. He's seeing a city ripe and alive with, with energy and with, uh, with, the fervor to reinvent itself. It's a very interesting passage. Um, when I hid my cast by Baburao Babu, came next, what's the, uh, the next book I translated, I found Babu's stories are, you, they're bullets. They're really, really powerful stories. And one of the most powerful of them is a story called Revolution. Uh, you shouldn't eat Revolution, read revolution before you go to dinner or lunch or any meal. It, because it's brutal. It's brutal because it, I've never read anything so moving in my life, I think. Because there's a moment in that story where the young man, we are told almost in passing, the, there's a young man, the center, the revolution, the revolt, the revolt staged by the young man. Is he's a young fellow who does not want to clean toilets manually. He's not interested in that. He wants to study. He's just finished his 10th standard. He has a possibility of getting into college. He wants to study further. But his father is ill and his mother has spoken to the, to the powers that be and he will be given his father's job, which is to clean toilets. And then the family will be able to eat better. In passing, we are told, this boy refuses to eat the food his mother cooks because her hands smell of human excrement. Because she is, if he's sick, that we can, as a society, have created a situation in which a boy would not eat his mother's cooking. Well, it's so heartbreaking to me. Heartbreaking. I, you know, people often come to me and say uh, they'd like to film what I write. And I say, take Baburao Babu, the first story which is set in a Maharwada, means in a village. Uh, actually, not in a Maharwada. It's set in a, in the uh, in uh, the upper class in an upper class house. That's almost cinematic. The way it's told, you actually see the cinema place, the camera placements in in uh, the process of, of him telling the story. It's so vivid and it's so full of action and so full of undercurrents. It's made for cinema. But as soon as you read the story, you realize that it is talking about caste in a way that we don't want to talk about caste. Our conversations, our cinematic conversations are not crafted around the idea of caste. Almost, you know, there'll be one or two, like uh, uh, a couple of Marathi films recently have been extremely good. But most of the time we don't, we don't address the issue of caste as we show. Baburao Babu does. And finally, there was Eknath Awad's book. Eknath Awad's book, Strike a Blow to Change the World. Uh, what an amazing story. Okay, here's the thing. Uh, in Daya Pawar's book, he escapes the village to come to the city and he makes his life in the city. 
He makes his life to the extent that when he opens, when he starts the book, he talks about himself as a Sarkari Brahmin. He talks about how his life is, you know, um, a bourgeois life. He has a, a flat. He has a government job. Uh, he has all the perks of being a government servant. Uh, and he's got this literary life as well. Eknath Avar starts out, he's a monk. To begin with, he's not a Mahar, he's a monk. Um, his father is a Potraj. Uh, a Potraj is uh, the guys you see walking around the streets with a whip, they whip themselves and they uh, they wear these khan, the, uh, they wear literally skirts you know, and they wear piles and, and whatnot. Uh, his father is a Potraj and he wants his son to be a Potraj. But Eknath is sure he's going to study and boy does he study. Uh, he finishes his BA, He's halfway through his MA when he hears about the MSW course. He goes and applies for the MSW course. He gets in. He does. He works his way through the MSW course. And after the MSW course, he is posted to Bombay in uh, Kandivu with a small unit, a small social work group. Uh, but and he gets. He's very fairly successful there. He's, he does good work there. And it's really weird. There's a really interesting moment. I'm not, sorry, let me not get ahead of myself. But there's something that says to him, the real fight is to be waged in the villages, in my village. I have to go back to my village and fight the caste wars there. This takes real courage. Because one of the stories that he tells us is of a young man who is dressed up and put onto a, as an asked to drive a, a, a construction work, you know, a road digger into a place where a well is, and then he is electrocuted to death. The idea is a human sacrifice is needed for the well to produce water. It's a superstition of the area. Often, uh, 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 Baluta, Dayapavar, the Mahar story begins with such a human sacrifice, where Baluta, the right to part of the produce of all the land, the right to have that produce, was granted to them because of the human sacrifice that one of the early Mahars did. Okay? Uh, so it takes a huge amount of actual courage, moral, physical, and intellectual to go back. And Eknath Award eventually pays that price. He's shot in the stomach. You know, he suffers deeply, but he makes a very, another very, very powerful choice. He decides to become, you know, to become a Buddhist. Now for a monk, this book opened my eyes to another level of caste politics that Ambedkar was seen as a Mahan. He was not a Mang leader. The Mang leader was a Nabhaus Hathi. The Mang, there were other Mang leaders. Ambedkar belonged to them. So he's, Eknath Awad tries to be the bridge between the Mang and the Mahan. It's a book that, you know, completely astonished me. And there is a section in it which, where a Bombay skyscraper begins to play a very interesting role in literally in translating life, okay, life itself, right? There are bonded laborers in the villages. People who live their lives in bonded labor, you know, they've taken a small loan and they pay with labor. They can never pay enough. They don't even pay the cap, the interest, the capital keeps growing, the interest therefore keeps growing. Then there's a marriage in the family. They go and borrow a little more money. The children are in bonded labor. Sometimes the fetus is in bonded labor. It's just incredible. Now, bonded labor is at one point outlawed by law. But the law does not say how you are supposed to free a bonded laborer. You just suppose it's just not allowed. Bonded labor is no longer allowed. But how are you supposed to free a bonded labor? So Ekna Tawad thinks up a very, very lovely moment. It's a lovely moment. Uh, he takes these two bonded laborers and he's just freed and he takes them to the city. 
He brings them from the village to the city, to a skyscraper, to a place where an associate of his lives on the 14th floor. He takes these people up into the elevator. They've never been in an elevator before. They come out into this 14th floor. They see the expanse of the city. And this man who is sitting there says to them, you are no longer bonded laborers. Go, I have freed you. And suddenly, just this experience of floating above the city, this experience of, of encountering this hugeness makes them sure they are not bonded laborers. It's an amazing story. Amazing that it could be a 20th century story. It sounds like something out of, uh, out of an imaginarium of what life is like in, 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 other, uh, in other worlds and in other places. So part of the, of the whole experience, my experience of translating has been either I have been translated to, I have become uh, a different person. Of course, you know, every, polit every act of speech, every act of writing, every act of creation changes us a little. We think we are shaping what we are making. Actually, what we are making is also shaping us. There's a, there's a give and take between these two. So the act of translation, you think, is I am, I am, this is a book, this is a language, this is a culture, this is another culture. I have to take this book across the river of meaning into another culture. I have to settle this family of words that someone else can constitute it as a family. I have to bring them here and make them feel slightly comfortable. Then I have to open the doors and say to everybody else, welcome. Yeah. Uh, this is what you think is your, your activity. And you think of it as an activity slightly at a distance from yourself. So my, my writing, my writing is different from my translation. My translation is that one removed from me. My writing is that is personal. It's what I do. Everything is personal. I've discovered. So is tra translation is personal. It's highly personal. Um, I think that's about all that I wanted to say today. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, Madhu, are there questions? As of now, no. Okay. Um, comments, boos, hisses. I think you can continue with your talk. Okay. Let me see if there is anything to continue with. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little about another experience that, uh, that I had. It's not a Bombay book, but it's an interesting uh, moment in, uh, in the idea of translation. So there is a Bombay scene in it at Prithvi Kyoto. Okay, here it is. Okay, the story of how this, this translation started is a very Bombay story. Uh, okay, it's done. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it begins with uh, with M in the Big Home, my, the novel that I wrote. I wrote a novel about uh, the fact that my I wrote a novel about a family dealing with the bipolar mother. And after that, uh, whenever I did readings, a huge amount of uh, of energy seemed to be um, seemed to be released. Right. Um, I didn't know how to deal with those energies at the readings, at those launches. So I told a friend that, I said, you know, I, I don't know what to do when people tell me their stories and what. And she said, oh, you wrote, uh, why don't you tell them to write? And so I started saying that. I said, you know, I wrote, why don't you write about what happened to you or what happened in your family? And one person said to me, uh, uh, why, what will happen if I write? So I said, uh, we could think about putting those together as a book if there's enough, so go ahead. I kept saying this and eventually a book of light happened. And a book of light was almost ready to be finished and to be sent to the, to the press. When one of the con contributors um, wrote and said, wrote an email to me and said, uh, do you remember Swadesh Deepa? So I thought, yeah, sounds familiar, but remind me. So she said, court martial. I said, yeah, 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 court martial, I'd seen this powerful play, again about caste and in the Indian uh, startling. And she said, you know what happened to him? 
So I said, no. What happened to him? She said, well, uh, he had a nervous breakdown. He had a breakdown and he tried to kill himself uh, two or three times. And uh, then he was taken. Uh, he tried to burn himself on fire at one point. And uh, he was taken to hospital where they didn't know where to put him in burn ward or the psychiatric ward. And eventually he recovered. He came home and his friends all said to him, right. Write about this experience of, insan of insanity, of madness, of living through madness. Because, you know, what you live through, right. He wrote. He wrote a book called Mene Mandu Nahi Dekha. And uh, this friend says, his son would like to write about the experience of living with Swadesh Deepak. And I said, fabulous, go ahead and write it. Sukant Deepak produced a beautiful piece, Papa Elsewhere, which I'm told is now going to become a play. And Papa Elsewhere, you know, I read it. It was a great piece. I put it in, packed the book off. And somewhere in the back of your head, you just notice, you know, I must read this book, but you're not doing anything about it because your life is busy as it is. Um, then at that point in time, I was helping Shireen Sabawala uh, with the Jah uh, Jahangir Sabawala bequest. Uh, she wanted to send his papers and his, uh, his paintings, some of the paintings that were left behind, the drawing books. Etc. to the museum, the Chhatrapati Shivaji, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahalaya. It's helping out with that, sorting out things. And in the middle of this thing, I found Mene Mandu Nahi Dekha. And I picked it up, read the title and said, what is this doing here? Then I looked back at the book and I thought, of course this is doing. I know what this is doing here. There is a Jahangir Sabhawala painting on the cover. No doubt he wrote and he asked for permission to put uh, you know, a Sabhawala painting on the cover. Sabawala very kindly consented. Uh, transparency was sent and this book then came as a thank you. So I turned to Shireen and I said, can I, can I borrow this? And she said, yes, sure, of course you can. And I took it home and on the way home, if I have a new book, I have to start reading it. So I was on the BESC bus, started reading this book and I got straight sucked into it. It was like nothing I had ever read. I, oh, and it was one of those dream fantasies come true, you know, like, you always want to know what it was like when five or six great authors are sitting in a room chatting. The first section of this book, is only about Nirmal Varma, Gagan Gil, Krishna Sobti, Swadesh Deepak, Vikas Rai, all sitting in a room and chatting. So I came home and I wrote to Sukhan Deepak and I said, you've got to translate this book. And he wrote back saying, too personal, I can't. And without thinking, I thought, I wrote, then I want to do it. And he said, delighted, go ahead. Started translating Mary Mandu Nahi Dekha, my first Hindi translation into English. Now the problem with that book is that when Swadesh Deepak goes into one of his fits of madness, he speaks English. English is the language of madness in a Hindi book, written by a Punjabi writer who also knew Urdu. That's translation for you. Those are the challenges of translation. Uh, for how I dealt with that problem, you have to read many months. I have not seen Mandu in translation. Comes out by Jerry Pinto next year. And in order to make it a, a, a viable ecosystem, because many Mandu Nahi Dekha talks a lot about the writing. I said we have to have the short stories and the plays come out at the same time. So we will bring out Swadesh Deepak's autobiography with his short stories and plays and translation at the same time, thereby producing a translation ecosystem. You have some questions now, I think. Uh, I think the first is, what do you think of Bhav Pandi as a writer? Very fine writer. In fact, I've translated a couple of his stories and they're coming out in books uh, next year. One of them is uh, a collection edited by me and Shanta Gokhale, or Shanta Gokhale and me, I should say, uh, respectfully. And the other one is uh, for another, a book of uh, short stories edited by another couple, another couple of young men. But happy to be asked to translate a Bhavapadhyay story. Enjoy him tremendously. Enjoy so much Marathi writing tremendously. So enriching to be able to read another language. Enjoy reading Hindi poetry tremendously. Enjoy doing Urdu tremendously. Uh, with uh, Saif Mahmood, I'm working on a translation of Majaz right now. It's lovely and enriching. Um, Second question, I think, came from Shainaz. What is uh, 
the relationship between my writing and my translating it's a very very uh, strained relationship i have to say because you know at the end of the day all you have is a fixed amount of time whether you are uh, you know the president of america or of the united states or you are jerry pinto sitting in mahim uh, you have those 24 hours and you have to decide what to do with 24 hours about 5 or 6 years ago after a couple of health scares i decided to uh, live a more rational and normal life i now sleep i now rest i now you know take time off from working but in between all of this i have to find the time to fit my try writing and my translation i have to find the time to fit in the poetry the editing the translation the teaching and just the living the ordinary me- mechanics of living you know just before i uh, i we started this thing i was washing clothes i hand wash clothes because i save the water i don't like washing machines uh, save the water to use in the toilet i was washing clothes that's all that also has to be done after this i will go for a walk and after that i will be with cook dinner my sister and i and that also has to be done all these things have to be done and so when you choose to do translation the question that i also ask myself is shouldn't i be writing shouldn't i be using this time to write and i think okay some writing every morning some translation every day i'll do both as long as i as long and then one day a bunch of young translators going to turn up great translators doing wonderful magical work and i will be able to sit back and read right now there's not enough translators not enough translators working hard not enough translators working with care and sensitivity not enough translators working with humility and when when the, all those those people turn up i'll sit back and i'll enjoy reading and i'll just do on my right only Maybe I'll mentor translation. Uh, what is the? Uh, someone asked what is what has happened to my writing because of my translation. Um, I say that uh, you know. Uh, I say, for instance, um, consider reading as a buffet. Yeah. Uh, I think of it as a buffet. i try to admit people from this uh, waiting room and i don't know what happens so okay. um we are we are admitting so okay great okay so i'll stop worrying about that um if you are most of us i think only read english or most of the time we read english okay right? we could read in other languages most of us do know devnagari we do know nagari script Uh, some of us even gujarati some of us know many scripts but we keep reading in english so i liken that to going to a buffet and eating butter chicken every day now butter chicken is a wonderful dish okay but every day every day butter butter chicken so i that's what i was doing i was reading every day every day reading in english and one day i thought i can read in other languages why am i not reading in other languages and so uh, that evening quite fortunate to see i went to prithvi to see a play so i walked into the prithvi theater bookshop and i was amazed they had a lovely selection of hindi poetry lovely selection so i selected a book i went up to the uh, to the uh, to the counter and i asked to pay for it to got my credit card and he said 65 rupees sir and i said it's you know this is gajanan mukti bodh's poetry and it's only 65 rupees i said yeah that's the price so i went back and took 10 more books and i piled them up next to my bed and i started reading in the every day just reading in the there was no thought at that point in time that i am reading hindi because i want to enrich my uh, my vocabulary my thought or my vocabulary or my mind or anything it was just i can why am i not then i learned to urdu i learned nastalik to read and to write so i started reading urdu every day and then uh, despite the fact that um, buying marathi books in bombay is a bit of a challenge you know you don't have very many good bookshops uh, the bookshops generally are almost like supply and demand bookshops you have to go to the counter you have to know what book you want in advance you can't browse you tell the person 
कोबाल्ट ब्लू बाय सचिन कुंदलकर कोबाल्ट ब्लू समन सेज कोबाल्ट ब्लू एंड प्रोड्यूसर्स इट इट्स पुट ऑन द टेबल यू ओपन इट एंड दे से आई वांट टू रीड इट हियर एंड आई टेक इट होम नाइस सार्कास्टिक मराठी आयरनी इन मराठी सो बट डिस्पाइट ऑल दैट आई बाय मराठी बुक्स बाय हिंदी बुक्स रीड अ लॉट ऑफ देम and any act of reading is a re- act of staining okay you will be stained you rang diya like that uh and so i think i am enjoying being stained by other languages i'm enjoying uh having them mess with my head i'm enjoying them fertilizing me i'm enjoying them opening my my senses up that's actually what happens um and also do a lot of reading yeah you, you know um one of the problems with translation is there's people always say to you there's so much that needs to be translated and you say yeah like give me your name and they say no no i'll get back to you definitely i'll get back they don't the only person who does actually few people who do one is shanta gotre you know if she won't tell you so much needs to be translated she'll say this needs to be translated it's a point to a book and it's a challenge and then you take the challenge pick up the challenge and do it and it can be quite fun so it is good if you have people like that there's also the other side of the of the coin which is the writer sends you their book uh, not wrong often eknath award was sent to me by his son milin award uh, but often the assumption is you will read it and then translate um it might not it might be a very good book but it might not be my book to translate you see uh your book comes to you and it announces itself to you i'll be reading something and half way through i'll realize that somewhere inside my head the words are playing they're playing and they want they're saying this is how this line would sound okay then no 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 not that way uh, we can't use the present continuous you know there's a present continuous in that sentence let's see how we try how it sounds here okay one minute it's in the passive voice i don't like it so suddenly all kinds of things are happening in your head and the book has announced itself that it wants that you're going to translate then you have to figure out the the modalities you have to you know sort of like find out who the who who can give you permission who has got the rights that's all and we want to that um can i quickly sure. intervene jerry this is bisp sure. balaporia <laughs> Hi. And uh, I just requested that I be unmuted so I could say hello. So sure, hi. And hey. but it's been great listening to you and this uh, uh, getting to know this part of you know the the, the translator. Yeah. And uh, and I can see how deeply involved uh, you yeah. got in that and it's done and it sounded amazing. I just thought um, hadn't met you for a long while and. Uh, i said old friend so just saying hi and thank you for hi. this afternoon it was hey, hi. really really worth listening to what you had to say oh, about it thank you uh, i think uh, someone asked about the translating humor in so really hugely difficult um i just finished a translation of rajendra banhatti's um, uh the last sort of book incredible it is a wonderful book you have to read it uh, in marathi if you can read it you have to read it because it's wonderful it's, and it's very very timely right now because it's a man who's locked inside a room he's locked in a room not because of because of old age the infirmities of old age he can barely move now he's 91 and so the only thing left for him to do is to write so he's writing his story he's telling his story it's a wonderful book but it is largely it's got a sly tongue in cheek humor okay uh, and sly tongue in cheek humor is always sly tongue in cheek humor is always very specific to language yeah what you can do with one language with humor you can't do uh, in another language easily so recently shanta gokle told me that she is translating pg woodhouse into marathi and i thought oh that is going to be something really interesting to read the pg woodhouse is almost completely and totally reliant on all the in jokes of the of the english language 
the fact that you know that he's quoting Tennyson at this point in time, the fact that you know that he's uh, that he uh, this is a little riff on on uh, Homer, or the fact that you know, like the or just the the madness of uh, Pip Pip, you know, and and I think I'll make like a hoop and roll over here. Just like, how do you, so I'm so glad that she's doing it because it will be a lesson. Like when I I'm, I want to read uh, Woodhouse Stroke Oakley because I will learn. It will be a learning. I will read the original and the translation side by side. I just read her translation of Shanti Ai. It's just done a fresh translation of Shanti Ai for Penguin uh, coming out next year. Please get it. Uh, it's an, Shanti Ai is an amazing book. It is an amazingly uh, modern book. It is a moralistic book. It is not a moralistic book so much as it is a didactic book. It seeks to, to, it seeks to educate you. It seeks to tell you how to live your life. It seeks to tell you what motherhood is about. It seeks to tell you what, uh, what, what, it seeks to set up some ideas and what, but it's got a modern uh, tinge as well, you know, looks at other nations approvingly from back to back, etc. So I really enjoyed reading that. When you read a translation, a good translation, something in your heart becomes very happy. Become You become very happy because this, this is an act in some ways of linking. It's a bridge between linguistic islands. Now in, in, in Bombay especially, since we are in Jashne Bombay, Jashne Mumbai, uh, Jashne Bombay, whatever you want to call it, um, we all live in, on linguistic islands which are connected at low tide. When the tide goes out, we can cross. I often speak in Marathi, I speak in Hindi, I speak in Gujarati, I speak in, you know, we use a little bit of of language all the time. I just sent a message to my friend Adil Jassawala. Tari uh, gift Things like that. Stupid things like that. Uh, we speak Hindi too. But we, these are agenda-based things. They are not uh, uh, they're not soul talk. Right? Translation is soul talk. It's linking people to each other on some very deep level when you do literary translation. And so that a good translation makes me happy and makes me make, makes me a little uh, more assured of of the possibility of a civilized tomorrow in this city. I think that's a good point at which to stop. Thank you so much, um, Asiatic Society, for organizing this. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you all of you for spending your time with me. Um, please go out and read a book in translation. It doesn't have to be my book. Uh, please go out and read, and read a book in your in your language, in your home language, in the language of your heart. Um, uh, please support uh, this activity. Uh, it is really important in a fundamental way because we are such a rich and diverse culture, even linguistically. I was talking to uh, Professor Devi, G. N. Devi of the Linguistic Survey of India. And he said, I said, how many languages do we have? And he said, we're still talking. Uh, so please do help building bridges. Uh, we've laid down the bridges. Please cross them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was really, really inspiring. Yeah. And you have, I think we go back with the message that we must read and not just in English, in many, many languages. And you reminded me of my school teacher, Miss Cornelius, who at that point of time, some 30 years ago, would insist that we translate one paragraph from the English newspaper in Hindi every single day. And we used to feel so resentful at that point of time, but listening to you, now I think it makes a lot of sense. I think I should go That's back to Hindi reading. Really ahead of Really, really ahead of the curve. Huh? Wonderful. Good to hear that. Thank you all very much once again. Uh, thank now you. I would. Another comment. I would. Enjoy. I, I invite Lakshmi to give the formal vote of thanks. Okay. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was absolutely mesmerizing to hear you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to thank you for sharing stories and all the knowledge and yeah. also patiently, uh, you know, talking to all of us. 
thank you very much, Mr. Jerry Pincho. My pleasure, Dai. And now you're getting an Adivi Mittal. Yay! Just kidding. I thank the audience for the active participation. Uh, thanks to all the sponsors and the donors. Uh, Voltas, Tata Investment Corporation Limited, State Bank of India, Trent Limited, Niyogi Books, and Ms. Humera Ahmed. Thank you very much.